Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zev from Z Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I've come down to see friend and full-time craftsman, Richard Roberts. Richard, how are you doing? Good, thanks, Zed. Right, so this video is a third installment in a three-part series that I'm filming with Richard on this particular visit down to see him. We're filming at a beautiful walled gardens in Bedford Park, which is on the East London Stroke Essex border. Now in the first video of this series, we looked at Richard's uh, whole process for carving an eating spoon. A very extensive video where Richard left no stone unturned. In the second video in this three-part series, Richard showed his process for carving a butter spreader, which was also a very detailed video on that entire process. On his third video, what we're going to be looking at is Richard's process for carving a salt bowl. Now, if you're unfamiliar with what that is, don't worry, we're going to be looking at a couple of examples in a moment. Three things just to quickly go over before we get into the meat and bones of this video. Number one, links to all the other videos will be down below in the description. Number two, I'm going to put a link to Richard's uh, Instagram where he's very, very active and you can see the plethora of work that he gets up to. And third is going to be a link to his website where you can see the myriad of work that he gets up to. He teaches uh, um, and also makes on a full-time basis so you can see everything that he gets up to on his website. Lastly, on the timeline on this video on YouTube, what you can see are the different sections of this process marked out. YouTube has a very cool feature where if you look in the description below this video, I have all the chapters laid out. And if you look at the time section on the very left hand side, you can click on that and jump straight to that particular section of the video. Now, the reason why I say that is because this video is designed as an actual tutorial where Rich is going to be teaching you what he does. And the hope is that obviously it inspires you, whatever level you're at with your carving, to give this a go. So having those chapters along will hopefully aid you within that process. So Richard, with your kind permission, shall we get started? Let's do it. So guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of this video where Richard Roberts is going to be teaching you how to carve a salt bowl. So Richard, we're looking at a couple of examples here of salt bowls. So may I ask you how this design and concept came about? I had some small scraps of wood, not long enough for a scoop, um, not long enough for a spoon. Um, I thought, oh God, let me just uh, carve a tiny bowl for the cuteness factor. It's an example of uh, one I did a while back, which is for sale on my Etsy store. Um, it's made of pear wood from my neighbour's tree, um, which they butchered when they uh, trimmed it. And uh, I salvaged a load of the branches. It's a very sort of simple design. It's got this nice flared out. Yes, all the way around. Um, basically, we, we, we call them salt bowls. You can put some salt in there, other spice that you could pinch and put over your dinner. You could have it there while you're cooking. Um, but it's probably best used for table, for salt, or just as a small decorative bowl. You could put a couple of little decorative stones in, a ring, your favourite earrings, or just leave it plain and blank. It's something to pick up every now and again, have a look at. So the concept is basically using small offcuts, basically small pieces. Of yes, wood. it's um, it's the waste not want not thing, and if you can make something out of a scrap of wood. Well, it's no longer a scrap of wood; it's either a useful object or just something nice. What we've got here is a small section of cherry split already. I mean what would you use this lump of wood for? I'd use it for a little salt bowl or a little bird bowl and uh, that's what we're going to make today. So a couple of questions then with wood selection. So are there preferred types of wood that you go for in terms of species? No, any wood will do for a little uh, um, salt bowl, absolutely anything. So unlike the spreader from the last video you can use the softest woods you can find. A uh, salt bowl doesn't have a rough life any soft, easy wood to carve is absolutely ideal. Or anything more pretty like cherry, a little bit harder to carve, a little bit tougher, but still a lovely wood. And in terms of diameter, because of the type of uh, um, uh, woodworking you're doing right now, is there an ideal diameter for this particular project? Um, for the diameter of the, the, the wood that it comes from yeah. or the diameter of the bowl? Uh, the diameter of the uh, wood it comes from. Uh, well, this is about three or four inches across. The type of uh, 
size log that would be ideal to split in half and get a couple of spoons from. This log wasn't very even, it had a bigger piece at the bottom and this flat a bit at the side. Um, so this bit wasn't big enough for a spoon, uh, deep enough for a spoon to get the crank and uh, the, you know, the nice uh, angles that you'd have in an eating spoon. So it was ideal for flatter things. And the salt bowl doesn't have to be deep, it doesn't have to be high, it can be shallow and wide, or it can be deeper and more cupped. Um, there's no particular design that works better than any other with a salt bowl because it's simply something that you'll put your fingers in, pinch a bit of salt, sprinkle it on your dinner. It's a real simple thing. So where would you like to begin then? What I'd do, um, this piece of wood is slightly wedge shaped. So I'm just gonna square out the bottom so it's parallel with the top. That'll be the first thing, I'm gonna knock down the sides and um, then attack it with a gouge to hollow out the middle. Once I've done that with the gouge, I'll come in with a spoon knife, tidy it up. Once the hollowing's been done, then I'll shape the outside of the bowl. So let's get on with the axing. Let's do that. So what axe are you using in case people are not familiar? Um, I have the Swedish carving axe by Gransfors Brooks, Swedish company. The axe was designed in collaboration with uh, Willy Sundquist, legendary person in the world of Sloyd. Hey, yeah, let's, uh, let's start working on this. First of all, I'm going to knock the sides off, actually, rather than flatten it. Yeah, I'll have less width of wood to remove if I uh, knock the sides off first. I'm just taking I don't know, a centimetre or so. I want to have it quite parallel with the separation of the orangey heartwood to the white sapwood. So we've got a bit of white sapwood on the outside. Uh, it doesn't really matter um, to do that. You could take it further if you wanted a narrower bowl. But whilst Cherry has got this two-tone between the sapwood and the heartwood, we might as well utilise that nice colour change and bring some extra dimension to the wall. That's parallel enough for our needs. That's done lovely. Now we need to uh, flatten out the bottom a bit. Still got a bit of the pith running in here, so we'd like to go remove the pith to get below that. The pith is the place where wood starts to crack. Uh, cracks originate from the driest centre piece of wood, which we call the pith. The pith is essentially the first part of the tree that grew. So it is in fact the oldest part of the tree, which I suppose is quite obvious. Trees grow from the outwards from their centre stems. Right, let's have a look at that. A little bit more off here, and then we'll be pretty much good to go. If you have a vice or a, a workbench with a vice or a vice that you can strap to a table, feel free to use that for the next bit which will be the hollowing. Oh, we just need to take a bit more off this bottom. That's quite more wedged than imagined. Let's have another look. There we are, we're getting there. Just got this lump in the middle to take out. We have to come back this way, so the way the grain's going. Very carefully, because I'm near the top of the wood. Don't usually advise axing up there. But in this case, I have no choice because of the grain direction. Okay, that's fine. We don't need it perfectly flat at the bottom because the wood will move as it dries and we've got to account for that in what we're doing. Okay, now it's time for the gouge. I'll just grab that. So just a quick look at the gouge then before we begin. So yeah, what gouge is... do you have? Right, this is, have a look at the profile of that. This is 
the gouge with the bevel on the outside, often referred to as out canal. And if the bevel was on the inside curve, it would be an in canal gouge. What we need is it on the outside so the tool comes in the wood and it wants to curve around like that as it cuts. Uh, this is an antique gouge, I say antique. Um, there's a little mark on here, uh, it says 1931 uh, military issue. So it's quite an old piece of kit, but it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, holds its edge for ages. This uh, was great and I absolutely adore its uh, octagonal handle and the patina on it of those 90 years that this has been in action. Right, here we go. So with these salt bowls, I totally freestyle them. I do not usually mark out anything. I just come in with a gouge. The step on my uh, chopping block is keeping this in place for me. I'll just turn it around to go this way and we just start taking out the little divot. It's just... Uh... If push came through shove and people watching uh, don't have a gouge, could they just begin this with a spoon knife? Yeah, you can totally do this with the spoon knife. Uh, I think most of mine were done just with the spoon knife. But if you do have a gouge, it just makes it so much easier to get to depth easy and quicker. Because I haven't got this held down, I, I have to keep grabbing the wood to uh, pull the gouge out of the wood. If you have got it held in a vise on the workbench, you'll be able to just like, work it all the way out. But for a little bowl like this, workbench isn't necessary. Because most of this will be done with the spoon knife. The gouge is just basically for getting the initial shape. Uh, I'm going to be going for an oval shape. Maybe a little bit longer than this, but we're quite close to the size we're going to have. More at this side, so you can get a bit more depth. I have to gouge quite upright when I start the cut, and as I'm going in, I'm slightly dropping the handle. There we go. Let's get those bits out. Let's have a look. Now we just need to come in and refine the shape. I usually will. This is where I go quite slowly. It's just wiggling the gouge until I've got it aligned just where I want it before I just give it a few little gentle taps. Just to refine out this edge. And make this shape a nice even oval. For those wondering where to get a gouge, antique ones are quite good. If you are good at putting new edges on your tools. If you aren't, look for the file series of carving gouges that you'll find many good uh, carving tool suppliers. The one I typically recommend is classic hand tools. Yeah. Yeah, so. And they'll be the same gouges that uh, our mutual friend Paul Adamson would uh, advise for the main hollowing of his cooksers that he does. So there we go, we've got a basic bowl shape there. Now I can put the walloper down and come in and just do some of this manually, pressing. So coming in very carefully align my gouge. And I'm pushing it and lowering the handle. Now I'm doing this quite slowly. Sometimes I go a bit faster. Let's do it slowly and carefully for the video. And we can clean up all of those hammered gouge marks. 
and work our way to a depth. As this is a straight gouge, it won't go too far around the curve, but that's okay. That's what we're going to use a spoon knife for. This is just for getting some good depth. I'm getting past the bark, which I don't really like cutting bark with my finishing tools. The gouge is a, essentially, for me, this gouge is a roughing tool. You can do some nice finished work with gouges. But for me, for this type of stuff, bowls, cooksers, it's just a roughing tool. Right, a little bit of work from this side. We're not trying to get it perfect yet. At this stage I'll have a look at the oval. I want to see if any bits need adjusting. Yeah, just a slight little bit here and I can come with the gouge around this way and just fatten out that corner and then just come back here. Come down, yeah, that's lovely for that. That's it for the gouge. Um, I'm probably about a centimetre away from the base for depth. There's a reason for that and I'll show you that later. Let's get the gouge put away. And go to the spoon knife. It's uh, my Lee Scoffer Sculp XL. But whatever spoon knife you have will be fine. If you've got a left and a right handed spoon knife that'll be good. But um, this sculp is an amazing tool. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to hollow a bit deeper, but we're also going to be just refining and getting rid of any gouge marks. And we'll work each corner outwards and around and across the grain. Salt bows don't have to be that deep. They're not holding a lot of stuff. Just enough for a few pinches of salt at the table, if you are using it for salt. Let's have a look at that, where are we at? A little bit of adjustment here. Keep in mind the angle that the bark is being cut at for your bowl so it flows with the corner and I want it to flow the same all the way around and as you can see here it's a bit steeper so I'm just going to angle the scalp out a bit so it gets a little bit more of the bark. Let's have a look at that. It's looking quite good. This bark's gone a little bit crumbly there. Let's see if we can cut that. Come down at an angle. Yeah. That's nice. Feel the smoothness, a little bit of a bump in the middle. I'm going to come from this side. Let's feel it again. If you want to leave more obvious tool markings in, in your bowl, that's absolutely fine. But for this salt bowl, especially as it's going to be holding a fine powdery substance, I want it to be smooth, don't want any bits getting trapped. And there we have it, that's the hollowing of the bowl complete. Um, we may go back later and do some small tidings up, but for now that looks absolutely fine. Let's just take a little bit there after I said fine. And there. Yeah, lovely. That's that hollowed out. Let's move on to axing the rest of the wood away. If you wanted to be a complete minimalist, you could leave it just like that. This nice lump of wood with a divot for salt. But let's shape it into a more traditional bowl shape. First of all, I'm gonna uh, knock off uh, corners and then we'll work on the angle and the underside slopes of the bowl. 
We're just going to come in here. Quite brutally and fast. Ah, unfortunately, we're knocking off a bit of the outer bark of this. So what I'll do eventually is peel this bark off and just leave the under bark. Which is a shame, I do like a, a bowl with its complete live edge. But I think it just bark. goes to show the reality you're working with a natural substance. Yeah, you can't guarantee bark will stay on even if the tree is felled in winter time when the sap is down. That's the thing, if, if, if the tree you're using was felled in the summer or the spring, there's highly likely that the bark will just fall off as the wood dries and shrinks. All right, let's see where we are. Just a couple of little drops just to start that. There we go. Another one. And using the axe to bend this piece of wood out gives me a nicer area to aim at. Use the angle of my chopping block to come down here. Take this angle off there. Lovely. Same on this side. First of all, do the bump cut just to see where I'm going. A little bit more. Oh, take it all off. Lovely, we've basically got it down to this shape now. And this is where we make some decisions. Let's just peel this off out of the way because it's distracting me. I think I'm going to have it with a little pinch handle at this end. And we'll just round this end off. Maybe give it a little bit of a point and that way it'll be a little bit like a little bird which I do love making little bird bowls, whether they're functional or just decorational. So we're going to knock a little bit more off of this side here to match the other side. Lovely. Right, let's uh, shape this beak end of the bird. So I keep my axe upright and I move the wood. As I go around, as I said earlier, I, I kind of freestyle these. If you want to draw on your design onto the wood, feel free to. It often helps with visualizing. As I'm quite a um, improviser, I like to design and prototype on the fly. If you're wanting to and create a series of bowls all the same. Maybe even best draw up a template that you can do more of an angle to meet that in the middle. Let's check that nearly there. Very close now. Lovely. I'm going to go back to my guillotining style again with the axe pushing down this curve so I can do a really nice slicing cut which will eliminate a few of these axe marks. Just make the knife work easier. and helps me get a nice curve. And I'll sort of do the same here from the side to blend that in. And the same here. So if we look, we're a little bit, little bit chunky there. Not everything has to be symmetrical and parallel. Birds certainly aren't when they're moving around. But I do like that look. Okay, I will leave the shaping of the back for the knife. But 
let's go in there and just carry on refining, getting rid of these axe marks and just blending this side's side into the front curve. Turn it around, same for the back. A little bit this side. I love this technique of rocking the axe head and using it as a kind of guillotine as a push tool you can you can you can do more accurate curves and things than you could probably do with free hand swinging of the axe okie dokie let's move on to the underside now first thing I'm going to do is take off these angles here I'm actually going to come from the side. I've got to bear in mind where the inside curve of my bowl is. So the inside curve of my bowl probably follows the edge of that axe. So I don't want to be cutting our slope into that. So I can start small here. That's definitely not going to clash with the bowl. I'm just going to move myself around a little bit more to make use of the curves of my axe block. And we're not going right to the tip where the bark is. We're going to leave it about five or six millimetres. So we've got some leeway to do stuff with the knife. Coming back this way, it's uh, always a bit more difficult. That's what I do. I visualise across there to where that cut's going to start and just, just, just put a little mark and usually just nick it a little bit. Then I'm aware of where this slope has to start. I'll also look down from above to match this angle with this angle before I start. If I just put in a little line there, it just gives me a, a small guide of uh, where the axe should go. Yeah, let's have a look at that, and that's great. That's more or less met it in the right place, uh, in the same place. Scoop out a bit more. This push cut again. Such a great useful technique with the axe doing this. And we're just trying to match these front curves, which I'll show you in a second. Yeah, that's good enough for now. So if you can see this. Now we're gonna knock the sides off. Um, depending on the design of your bowl and the grain direction will be whether you come from this side or that side. First of all, I'm gonna try from this side. I'm gonna come in just in there because this will probably just split off with a couple of drops yeah you can see that just split off there just assess where it's split where the grains flowing I can come in and I'll blend this into that first cut this time going all the way up to the edge of the bark as you can see there this slope comes all the way up to where the bark meets and same for the other side, just clear, clear the wood chips. Right, so we started there, we did a little drop, let's try and match the angle. Keep my fingers away from the axe blade. That's that chipped off nicely, how are we angle wise? A little bit shallow on this side, but again, this technique, you can come in and refine that. We know that's going to go all the way up to the edge of the bowl. Can do that there. Now let's get there. Let's do this bit. So, move the wood, not the axe. Clashing a little bit with my block there. I 
always find this side much harder than the other side. It'll... So again, the guillotine action will help do that. That's looking pretty nice. Blend it in a bit more here. It's quite boat-like at the moment, this one. You could have a boat bowl, you could have a bird bowl, you can have a traditional looking miniaturised bowl. It looks like one of those classic Swedish bar cup bowls. It is up to you. Right. I'm going to come in and do the little drop cut again, just to get that started. So this is the back end now, yeah? Yeah, working on the back end. And if there's a bit of a bird theme to this, we're creating a tail. So the first, uh, the front is going to be the beak end. Let's have a look at that. Yeah, as the wood curves up unevenly, we just all shape that and it gives it that nice organic shape of a bird in movement with the wood not being absolutely symmetrical. A little bit of my guillotine cuts there. Always keep an eye on your base, you don't want your base to go too small. My base is still really rough here as you can see, I haven't even got rid of that bit. And there's a reason for, for that, we will address the base once we've moved on to the knife work. And we'll be using a technique that I use on the bottom of my cooks cups bottom of my big bowls, bottom of my uh, turned vases and my turned cups. Okay, that's that flowing around there okay for axe level. Now we'll hollow out where the tail is. So I'm just going to start by just taking off a little bit there, then move back a little bit, take a bit more. And a little bit more. Always stop and have a look. I don't want to go too close to the wood at the back because I want that as a little pinch handle that you can pass the salt with. Yeah, you could always do that, but it's quite nice like this. Okay, let's have a good old look. Let's feel how thick our walls are. Very thick at the moment, but that's good. We need leeway. We can take quite a lot more out of this, but what I'm gonna do is my old guillotine cut, because I wanna do a nice curve. And I can do that by rotating the ax as I push through it. You can see that's quite a nice clean curve there. Same on this side. Push and rotate. Stop to have a look, make sure you're doing it in the right direction, make sure you're giving it a nice flow of a bird or a boat or whatever particular styling you're giving your bowl. If you're starting with a smaller piece of wood, you could do the whole bird bowl with the spoon knife and the sloyd knife, and you wouldn't even need to have your axe with you or a chopping block. Take a bit longer, a bit more of a task, but all good fun. Okay, we've got a bit of gunk on the end. This is where I'd uh, use PVA glue to seal the wood to keep it fresh, to keep the moisture inside it. So we're gonna get rid of that once again with my guillotine push cut. You just come in, just take off a couple of shavings there. One in the other direction. A 
Lovely. And we're going to give this a little bit of a V. Um, I'll probably do that bit with a knife. It's going to be a bit easier. Okay, yeah, now it's time for the knife work. Right, here we are. I'm going to start just by uh, getting rid of this outer bark. Should just peel off reasonably easy. And just the, if people haven't seen the previous videos, what knife are you using? Oh, this is a blade forged by the wonderful Nick Westerman. He's a blacksmith that lives in Snowdonia in Wales. His products are so popular and uh, his products are so good, they're becoming incredibly popular and uh, there's now a three year waiting list for, for his blacksmith goodies. Okie doke, just having a quick look around what needs to be done. How am I going to style this bird? First of all I want to get rid of this ridge here. Um, Birds don't have ridges. This cherry's quite hard. And we're just doing a curved cut, if you can see that appearing there. You can start defining where the bird's head is. Push cuts are your friend, thumb pivot push cuts, that is. And this is the pleasurable bit. You can just sit here whittling away, fussing as much as you want or as little as needed. It's totally up to you. Salt bowls aren't as essentially functional as something as a cup or an eating bowl. They can be a little bit more rustic, a bit more rough. They're only really going to be holding salt. I guess you could use them as little sauce pots as well. If you are going to use them as a sauce pot, just make sure the inside has got a, a nice clean knife finish so you don't get food residue sticking on a rough hairy surface. Hairy surfaces are one of the reasons a lot of us in this greenwood carving game don't use sandpaper. Uh, sandpaper always leave a furry surface and if you imagine a wet sauce is going to stick to all those little tiny microfibers. And let's refine this back curve for its tail. Essentially the same curve as what we did with the axe, we can just come in and do that nicely. It's also other knife grips you can use. I wouldn't say there are any set knife grips you should use for this project. If you've carved a spoon, if you've carved a spreader, most of the knife cuts would just be completely familiar to you. Okay, now we're going to come to the sides. So from the centre of the bowl towards the tail we will cut there and then from the centre of the bowl we'll cut towards the front. We can't cut from the front to the centre. It's to do with wood direction and the way the grain lies on the wood. And we'll just refine this and you can decide whether to have nice rustic knife marks or you can do a lot more knife cuts to give a smoother surface. Entirely up to you what aesthetic you want to go for. I don't have any set aesthetic for my work. It's always how I feel, what I'm feeling like I want to create. What the, suits the project, the wood, the function. So for this, and as it's a bird that's got feathers, I'll probably leave some quite noticeable knife marks. One tip for leaving nice facets in things like this is to do this part of the bowl with your spoon knife. 
and each cut will be like a very shallow little gutter which will reflect light and throw shadow differently across its width to a cut with a flat blade. So depending on the type of blade you use you can get different effects of the light. Okay, that's that down. Just move to the back. Now doing push cuts here, it's quite hard and your fingers are in the way of the blade. So if possible, you can do the potato peeler cut. Do that. Look, how are we looking? Now let's follow the bark with the bottom edge of this tail of the bird rather than following the parallelness of here. So we'll take a bit more out there. Remember when you're carving away, always check, have a pinch between your bowl and the outside wall just to see where you are. On this one, you can see we've got really thick walls. Uh, a lot more material could be removed. And we probably will. I think what I'm going to do is give this bowl's rim a bit of a flare out. So I need to choke up on my knife a bit, so I'm using the narrow end so it can turn corners and follow curves easier. Let me just keep going around and see what that's like. And just keep styling and shaping the outside of the bowl to your taste, preference, styles you like. You could do an ultra modern bowl with very smooth surfaces, very straight edges. It's entirely up to you, but these little cute things have got a certain rustic folk art charm to them, which is a style I often chase. But as you can see how far we're along in the time that we've been doing it, and we've had no special edits, no boo Peter, this is what I did earlier. This is a very, very quick project. Now let's have a look at that. You see this side? It's got this nice flare out there compared to that side which is just flat. Both are just as good as the other. This one, it's just got a nice little look and I like it. So let's have that on this bowl. Just another safety tip. Don't have your thumb there, you'll cut it. Try and have your thumb tucked under. When you're doing this bowl, it's great. You, you can half hook your thumb on the rim of the bowl and it's not gonna slide off. So these bowls are actually quite a nice little safe thing to do for beginners. If you're gonna do your first bowl, do a tiny bowl. Less wood to remove. A lot easier and quicker to carve. When I was a beginner, it took me ages to carve anything. I used to get frustrated at how long it took me. So doing a small little bowl, it's quite an ideal thing to uh, not stretch that beginner's patience too much. Yeah. Just refining the front curve of the base, 
don't feel these things have to be perfectly round, perfectly symmetrical. You can chase perfection, it often comes with a bit of stress. I've actually decided to blend this area in to the rest rather than keeping this edge. I decided it looked better without it. Okay, now for a bit of the beak, I like to take the tip off the bark, go down until we hit the wood. Got a little beak sticking out there. That's a little bit furry, so let's see if we can just very gently take that furry bit off. We can wait until it's dry to do bits like that. I don't like to just put a bevel on the bark at the front of a bird bowl to give this end a bit of a different look to the rest, so it looks like a bit more like some kind of symbolic bird's head. It's not 100% bird, but you get the idea. You can style things slightly different. And like I said, this doesn't have to be a bird bowl at all. It could be any any kind of shape. I just thought it's like a it's like a little robin or a wren or something. So, and I love birds. They're pretty cool little things. Okay, that's basically the outer walls and uh, shaping and styling done of this. There's a um, couple of last things. Uh, for this particular one, I'd like to give it a bit more of a bird-like tail. Um, so I'm just gonna go for a, a simple curve in here, just so it's got the hint of like a, a, a forked bird's tail. We're not gonna go full forked, because we just wanna have a little hint just just so it's just just add a little bit of personality into what would have just been a flat area and I would just do this little scooping cut here let's make that look more symmetrical there lovely then that's it, that's your little salt bowl. You can pick it up. Got one last thing to do. Okay, one of the last things to do is to refine this base. Now, green wood, this is uh, quite fresh green wood. Um, it can move and distort as, um, as it dries. If we, say, took a plane to this and made it lovely and flat, in two weeks time, it might be rocking. So, to make that easier, what we'll do, we'll get the scalp and we'll create a hollow in the underneath. Now this is one of the reasons why I didn't go too deep with the bowl, why I left. It's a bit less than a centimetre, but a centimetre is, especially when you're first doing these things, is a sensible amount to have. So we basically want to create a, a small hollow on the underneath. And obviously people use whatever spoon knife they have. Yeah, any, any spoon knife will do this. Um, for bowls it's often useful if you've got a left and a right handed spoon knife. But don't worry if you haven't. If you can carve a, a spoon with just a left or a right handed one, you'll be fine doing a salt bowl. It's just, just think of it as a slightly deeper spoon. splinter off there. Ideally I'd probably take the rim that's going to be left down past that little split for, but for today we'll pretend that didn't happen and we'll just hollow this out a bit more Got a little knot here which is proving a bit tough to cut through. Let me just look at that. Let's come back here, a little bit of a push cut. 
just so I can control the speed at the end of the cut because it's only my thumb pushing well actually my thumb's the pivot it's the twisting of the spoon knife that is actually providing the power keep those fingertips out of the way okay so when this is dried this might be wobbly when you come to straighten that up you may only have to cut off a high bit there or there or wherever the high bit is to smooth it down so for now this is done I will tidy up this whole base when the whole object is dry but there you have it it's a quick little salt bowl I think that's probably 25 minutes it would take probably less if it was just me in my garden with no Zed filming me, making me nervous. Ah, a camera in your face. Yeah. <laughs> so just a couple of things then to wrap go, up a little, on. Little Rich. Uh, cherry Rory wood breast, so uh, a red breast uh, salt bowl. A yeah, couple sorry, of things Lou. then to go on to is, number one, the drying. So what's your process for drying this item? Um, slowly. Um, you can put it in an open paper bag, um, somewhere cool in the house. This is going to be more prone to cracking than a spoon, especially with how thick I've left the walls. Now there is absolutely no reason why you can't carve this really thin. You can get the walls down to two or three millimetres all the way around. Um, just leave it a little bit thicker at the base to take the divot and to have enough to refine once it, it moves. But yeah, dry it slowly. Uh, don't be as blasé as I am with a spoon, which I just leave out on the side. Because spoons are so unlikely to crack once they're carved thin. Um, bowls, not so much. We tend to leave our bowls with thicker walls. Therefore, when wood shrinks, it likes to move. If the wood is too thick, it will pull itself apart and create cracks. If the wood's nice and thin, it will just distort and bend. You think about the difference between bending a thin piece of veneered wood and a plank. You can't bend the plank, it will snap, but you can bend that veneer a lot. Lastly, oiling. Do you, do, do you oil these items? Uh... You can oil a salt bowl. You don't have to oil. If you're just going to be using it for dry stuff like salt, bare wood is absolutely fine. If you're thinking you might want to put tomato sauce in it or some kind of dip, if it's like slightly bigger, you wouldn't get much in this. Um, oil it. I use a linseed oil, um, a natural untouched linseed oil, not from a hardware store. Um, there's a few places online you can get it. You can even contact me on my, through my Etsy store. I can sell you a small quantity. Um, from my uh, big tub of it. Uh, it's a high quality Swedish linseed oil that I use. The flax is grown at high altitude. They then uh, heat treat it, but in a traditional way, it's literally just the raw oil heated to a certain point, which uh, eliminates certain proteins, which are the ones that can cause any plant oil to go rancid. So once they've heated that up, it makes it easier to filter and you have this really nice oil. It doesn't yellow as much as other linseed oils, but it still does yellow the wood. It will give it more of a golden hue. The white of the wood will turn uh, orange and the, um, let's just call it the, 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 the red heartwood, the cherry will just go a nice warmer, more intense version of itself. Uh, yeah, that's about it for oiling. Um, other alternatives, if you can't find a good linseed oil or you hate the smell of linseed oil, if you haven't got a nut allergy, there's walnut oil. Now you can get that from the supermarket, it's great on your salad, it's great for a little bit of cooking. And also, it's like linseed oil, it's one of the oils that will harden as it dries and leave a plasticky like substance. It won't stay liquid it will cure into a nice waterproof coating. That coating can wear over time, so you know you can always top it up with another little bit when the wood goes a little bit dry looking. But here we have it. Ah, 
So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. Richard, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, Zed, the as pleasure, always. The pleasure has been all mine. So guys, to do a full recap, this is a third video in a three-part series that I filmed with Richard here at the beautiful location on the Essex and London border. So a recap that video one was a detailed look at Richard's process for carving an eating spoon. Video two was looking at the entire process Richard use, uses to carve a butter spreader. And in this video, as you've seen in part three, we've looked at uh, Richard's process for carving a salt bowl. This is actually the first time I've seen the entire process um, and so it was really kind of insightful for me as I was filming this and obviously as you're watching this for the first time so another couple of reminders that below is a link to Richard's Instagram if you're getting any value from this video whatsoever it would mean the world to me head over to Instagram give him a follow it's also a great place to contact Richard if you have any questions or queries whatsoever and lastly there will be a link below to Richard's website Richard sells his wares. He also teaches um, here, mainly at this location, but also around the country. Um, and he's just a fantastic guy to get in touch with, to see the myriad of work that he gets up to. He's very talented across a multiple uh, disciplines when it comes to green woodworking. And lastly, but not least, uh, Richard at this location runs a regular spoon carving meetup mm -hmm. and green woodworking meetup. So if you're located within the Essex, London region, or you're willing to travel down, it's totally open to the public. There'll be a lot more information on Richard's website, which is linked to down below. And lastly, as I've mentioned at the very beginning, this video is timestamped for all the different sections, but this is designed as an informative stroke tutorial guide, okay? So if it's something you, you haven't attempted yourself to carve this, then the idea is you can come back to this video as a reference material. Richard, a sincere thank you once again. So to wrap up the three part series, are there any parting words from yourself? Get wood carve that's it get tools as well that's usually that's quite it. helpful unless you have a beaver you can chew some stuff out for you that's it and uh, tools you're never going to have enough tools be, no be warned yeah be warned <laughs> it's an addictive hobby right guys so there you go really do hope you enjoyed this video sincerely appreciate you watching all the way up until now the end if you have done so and like i said links to every single thing that we outlined below highly recommend you check out the other videos i've done with richard and on that note as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. For myself, Zed Outdoors, and Richard Roberts of RT Wood, peace out.